This video is brought to you by Skillshare. More about them later. What images pop into your head when you hear the name Herbert Hoover? In the past three years have been a time of unparalleled economic calamity. They have been years of greater suffering and hardship than any which have come to the American people since the aftermath of the Civil War. It's probably pictures of the Great Depression, people waiting in bread lines, trying to hitch a ride on the side of the road, or living in shanty towns. And when it comes to the man himself, you're probably thinking of some fat cat Wall Street guy. The apostle of laissez-faire so dedicated to his creed that he did nothing in response to the greatest economic downturn in the nation's history. An American Nero fiddling while Rome burned. But what if I told you that this popular depiction of Herbert Hoover has nothing to do with reality? We have used the credit of the government to aid and protect our institutions, both public and private. We have instituted measures to assist our farmers and our homeowners. We have created vast agencies for employment. Generations of Americans have grown up with this narrative of Herbert Hoover and the Great Depression. I remember my own U.S. history teacher in high school not only calling Hoover a do-nothing president, but lumping him in with Coolidge and Harding to call them the do-nothing trio. And you don't have to dig very deep to uncover the truth here. And this isn't some revisionist interpretation of the past, but rather a look at all of the evidence and facts that would have been available to anybody that bothered to look. I mean, in 1932, FDR criticized the Hoover administration for blowing up the budget deficit, and his running mate, John Nance Garner, went even further, claiming that the Hoover administration was taking America down the path to socialism. And that's a pretty big difference from what we are taught about Herbert Hoover. And that's the story I want to tell you. I want to tell you who Herbert Hoover actually was. What did he actually do in response to the Great Depression? How we got the history wrong and why it matters. Further steps towards economic recovery is the most urgent problem before the entire world. Ceaseless effort must be directed to the restoration of confidence, the vanquishing of fear and of apprehension and thus the release of the recuperative spirit of the world. If we look back over the disasters of these three years, we find that three quarters of the population of the globe has suffered from the flames of revolution. Many nations have been subject to constant change and vacillation of government. Others have resorted to dictatorship or tyranny in desperate attempts to preserve some kind of social order. The Republican Party has ever been the party of constructive action. It will support the new administration in every measure which will protect, will promote public welfare. It must and will be vigilant in opposing those which are harmful. Herbert Hoover grew up in poverty, but by almost sheer force of will, he pulled himself out. It would manage to become one of the first graduates from Stanford University, studying mining and engineering. He would eventually take this mindset for precision and top-down engineering with him into public office. Hoover's early life and career would be sandwiched between the populist and progressive eras, and he would be drawn into the progressive wing of the Republican Party. This can be seen as early as 1909 in his book, Principles of Mining, which was used as a textbook in mining and engineering programs, in which he speaks favorably about unions and supports policies such as the eight-hour workday. Hoover and his family were living in London at the beginning of World War I, and he helped organize the return home of thousands of Americans who became stranded in Europe due to the fighting. This brought him to the attention of the Wilson administration, who put Hoover in charge of delivering relief aid to Americans in Europe. After the U.S. entered the war, he was promoted to head the U.S. Food Administration, which handled U.S. supply lines and food relief for Europe. After the war, he continued his work in bringing food to the starving parts of Europe, including Germany and Russia. This would earn him the moniker Master of Emergencies in the press. He was very popular within the progressive wings of both parties. In fact, Wilson's assistant secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, tried to convince Hoover to run as a Democrat in 1920, but Hoover decided to place party loyalty above political grandeur and thus was rewarded by the winning Harding by being named Secretary of Commerce. During his time in the Wilson administration, he had drafted plans for an economic reconstruction of the United States, which would put greater government control over industries and grant much greater power to labor unions. He also drafted plans for a continuous series of infrastructure projects that he believed would permanently end economic depression, which was the order of the day when Harding was sworn in in March of 1921. The American economy had fallen into a depression in 1920, and Hoover wanted to respond. But by the time he finished drafting his plans in the fall of 1921, 
The depression was over and the economy was moving again, and so there was little demand for government intervention. Despite this, he would keep these plans in his back pocket, waiting for the opportunity to get to use them. And he would. As Secretary of Commerce, he took the side of unions and disputes with the owners whenever he was involved. The department encouraged greater ties between industrialists and unions and called for federal mandates to standardize the manufacturing of various consumer goods. He also advocated for federally regulated cartels through the use of ethics codes, which would functionally protect established interests as a means of preserving union jobs. His policies and proposals were praised by labor unions and progressive activists at the time. Hoover would become president himself in 1929, the first and only elected office he ever held, and he would have the great misfortune of serving during the greatest economic collapse in the nation's history. And this is where we shatter this myth of Herbert Hoover as the do-nothing president. Two courses were open to us. We might have done nothing. That would have been utter ruin. Instead, we met the situation with proposals to private business and to the Congress of the most gigantic program of economic defense and counterattack ever involved, ever evolved in the history of the Republic. President Hoover finally had an opportunity to use those plans he had devised nearly a decade ago. And within a week of the stock market crash, he held a conference at the White House with industrialists and bankers, where he told them not to fire workers or to reduce their wages. In past depressions, as revenue declined, wages would also decline. This allowed more workers to keep their jobs. But Hoover subscribed to the wage theory of depression, which is popular amongst labor activists. The theory postulates that depressions are caused by reduced spending power from workers, and if you want to prevent depressions, you need to preserve wages. This theory, then and now, made zero sense to actual economists. Wages always went down during depressions because sales went down. If an employer isn't taking in enough revenue, they can't afford to pay their employees higher wages. President Hoover was asking these companies to not only continue paying their workers an artificially high wage, but to do so while revenues were going down. And he made them sign a pledge that he wouldn't do either. And with this pledge came an implied threat that he would use the executive branch to either publicly shame these companies or even take legal action for breaking their publicly made promise. The problem with this system is that it forced businesses to take on debt in order to continue paying their workers at this now inflated labor value. Many businesses weren't able to secure loans and thus went under. These employees went from having an artificially high wage to having no wage at all. Prices collapsed 23% while unemployment hit about 25%. Hoover tried to force banks to give more loans, but they were hesitant to take on risky investments. They were also waiting on the Federal Reserve to act, in contrast to previous crises before the Fed's existence. Despite this, Hoover would begin the largest peacetime expansion in federal spending up to that point, increasing it by 40%. He would also use federal legislation to respond to the crisis, starting with the Agricultural Marketing Act, which had been signed into law several months before the crash had actually happened. This act was used to create the Federal Farm Board, which would subsidize the agricultural industry by buying up crops and paying farmers to let land lay fallow. In 1930, he passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, which had been in discussion as far back as 1928. Not only did this bill satiate the tariff tendency of the early 20th century GOP, but it was also seen as a support to labor by protecting domestic production against foreign competition. However, this tariff also meant that foreigners wouldn't buy American manufactured goods either, which hurt prices even more. After the Democrats gained control of Congress in the 1930 midterms, Hoover would sign the Employment Stabilization Act in 1931. This bill orchestrated construction projects around the U.S., with a particular emphasis on dams such as those in the California Central Valley, the Grand Coulee Dam, and most famously, the Hoover Dam. In January 1932, Congress created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which gave out loans to shaky banks, emergency funds to businesses, and was eventually used to give direct monetary aid to the unemployed. This was followed up by the Federal Home Loan Act, which gave out subsidized loans for mortgages in order to encourage more money to flow into the economy, encourage more construction, thereby raising prices and putting people back to work. During his presidency, the Federal Reserve also began intervening more directly in the economy by buying up assets, increasing its holdings sixfold. By the end of his presidency, Hoover was calling for a bank holiday, but unlike his successor, he didn't presume the president had the power to do it on his own. He also began to blame gold owners for the crisis, just as FDR would. Hoover would set up the Citizens Reconstruction Organization, which used tax dollars to spread propaganda, calling gold owners traitors to the country. Now, if you've studied the Great Depression before, a lot of this might sound familiar, and that's because FDR would go on to do the exact same things. Roosevelt saw everything Hoover was doing and said, 
Hold my crutches. It's basically the quiet kid says a joke and no one responds, but the popular kid repeats the same joke but louder and everyone laughs. But here's the thing. Those policies were just as useless when FDR did them as when Hoover did them. I'll explain more in a future video, but suffice it to say that historians and economists nowadays are in agreement that the New Deal did not end the Great Depression. They are in disagreement over what did end the Great Depression, but they're more or less in agreement that it wasn't the New Deal. But that begs the next question I wanted to answer in this video. How did we get the history so wrong? But before we get to that, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is the all-in-one learning platform with thousands of video courses on subjects varying widely as how to use editing software, how to diet, how to build things. There's whatever you're interested in, there is so much available for you. If you're interested in becoming a YouTuber or some kind of internet creative type like myself, then I suggest this newest course put out by Marquez Brownlee, aka NKBHD, on how to run a successful and thriving YouTube channel. If all this sounds appealing to you, then good news, because I have an offer for you for a free trial membership of Skillshare Premium. By clipping the top link in the description or in the pinned comment below, you can get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Watch as many courses as you want on anything you want, and if you think it's right for you, then go ahead and subscribe for a full year. It's about a hundred bucks. It is definitely worth it. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, but now back to the history. The least likely reason is the post-presidency of Herbert Hoover. You see, although during his presidency Hoover was a proto-New Dealer, he would eventually come to reject government intervention into the economy. This ideological shift is reflected in the Hoover Institute at Stanford, which he founded in 1919 to collect primary sources about the Great War. But the reason this isn't likely is because the narrative around Hoover being a do-nothing president predates Hoover's ideological shift. The second most likely reason, I believe, is a collective post hoc ergo proctor hoc fallacy. For those of you who don't know the Latin, or haven't seen the West Wing, it's basically a fallacy that states that if B happens after A, then B must have been caused by A. Applied to the history of the Great Depression, we are taught that the New Deal ended the Great Depression, which means that if FDR did a set of things that ended the Great Depression, Hoover must not have done anything. But as stated earlier, the New Deal didn't actually end the Great Depression, and was more or less just a repeat of all the policies Hoover had implemented. And so, although this might explain how the myth has been perpetuated, it doesn't really explain how it came into existence in the first place. The actual reason has to do with propaganda from FDR's campaign and administration. Something you should know about FDR is that he was a habitual liar. But more diplomatically, he was the most politician-y politician who ever politicianed. I mentioned earlier that Roosevelt criticized the Hoover administration for expanding the budget deficit, but he did that while at the same time criticizing them for doing nothing in response to the Great Depression. Present leadership in Washington stands convicted, not because it did not have the means to plan, but fundamentally because it did not have the will to do. In the 1932 campaign, FDR simultaneously said that Hoover had done nothing in response to the Great Depression, while also saying that he was spending too much money. These lies shouldn't be a surprise, as Roosevelt promised that he would decrease taxes, increase spending, and balance the budget all at the same time, which is financially impossible to do. But these lies about Hoover didn't end with the campaign. Throughout his presidency, he and his administration perpetuated this lie, that Hoover had done nothing. FDR had thrown his friend, a man he once tried to convince to run for president as a Democrat, under the bus without a second thought, and then continued to spread these lies about him, literally, for the rest of his life. And this narrative of Hoover as the do-nothing president was propagated and perpetuated by journalists who reported everything the White House did and said, and they loved President Roosevelt. This impacted the later historical records, as historians began to write the first histories of the New Deal in the late 40s and early 50s. When digging for primary sources, they find thousands of headlines and articles calling Hoover a do-nothing and praising FDR's decisive action, all the while the progressives and unions that praised Hoover's policies get buried under New Deal propaganda. It wasn't until the 1960s that we saw economists such as Milton Friedman, who had worked in Roosevelt's Treasury Department, begin to reassess the New Deal, as well as the legacy of Hoover. And as the policies of New Deal liberalism began to fall apart in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, these ideas became more mainstream among economists. We wouldn't see historians begin to reevaluate the New Deal and Hoover until the 1980s, when they finally started looking at the economic literature on the matter. Historians are notoriously bad at interdisciplinary studies. 
Okay, so what we're taught about Herbert Hoover isn't true, and it's because FDR and the media did him dirty. Why does it matter today? Well, for two main reasons. Firstly, it's because the story about Herbert Hoover and the New Deal in the Great Depression are vitally important for modern political narratives. Whenever there is a recession or some kind of economic downturn, there is always a demand for some kind of government response. And every president who has faced one of these moments since then, including Republicans, has responded with some kind of economic intervention. The story we are told is that Herbert Hoover did nothing, and then the Great Depression got worse. This myth has created a false dichotomy. Either the government must intervene in the economy, or we will have another Great Depression. And this false dichotomy has resulted in even more government involvement in the economy, which means more and more involvement in the lives of individuals. Every corporate bailout or stimulus check sent out is done with this dichotomy in mind, and it dominates our politics to this day. The other reason is that a president and his administration with a cooperative media environment can effectively rewrite the history in real time, and we are seeing President Biden and his administration attempting to do so as we speak. Shortly after Joe Biden's inauguration, officials and representatives from his administration were telling the press that the Trump administration had no plan whatsoever for vaccine distribution. They would later claim that the Trump administration had done nothing in response to the pandemic, which is patently false. Dr. Fauci contradicted that first claim, having worked on the distribution plan with the Trump administration. On top of that, the vaccine was already being distributed to the public prior to Biden entering the office at just under 1 million doses a day. We also shouldn't forget that back in February of 2020, the Trump administration issued the travel ban on China and Europe in order to prevent the spread of COVID into the United States, and later signed the relief bills that provided funds for businesses struggling during the lockdowns, as well as two separate $600 payments to adults. There are plenty of things you can criticize the Trump administration for. You can say they should have done more, you can say they should have done things differently, and if you really wanted to, you could even say they had done too much. But the one thing you can't honestly argue is that they did nothing. But that's the myth the Biden administration is trying to spread. Fact checkers seem to be doing their due diligence on this story, and some press outlets are reporting these claims as untrue, but not as vociferously as they did exposing the lies of the Trump administration. But the connections between Biden and FDR don't end there. According to reporting from Axios, he recently had a meeting with a bunch of American historians where he asked them a lot of questions, in particular, a lot of questions about FDR. According to some of these reportings, he wants to be the most impactful president since the FDR and leave his own New Deal-type legacy. Time has made it difficult to replicate some of FDR's persona, but he seems to be making do without the polio just fine. If you're interested in learning more about misconceptions about presidential economic policies, then I suggest you watch this previous video of mine about the Wilson administration's policies of nationalizing most of the economy during World War I. If you're interested in kind of a different perspective on the Great Depression, then I suggest you watch this video about the role monetary policy played in it. So go ahead and check either of those videos out. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.